you think you can compare Ruben uh, to the soldiers that are serving today in Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, because I, first of all, there's a big difference between us and the soldiers in Iraq. Uh, I'm speaking for myself, and I'm not speaking for the other members of my company. Uh, I was a cook in this staff in Japan, all right? And when we went on maneuvers on Mount Fuji, we fed the other guys that we didn't, we didn't learn anything, all right? And, uh, the only thing I knew how to fire was an M1. I didn't know how to fire. I never fired a machine gun. You know, when it come in handy later, uh, I couldn't. I didn't know how to handle a mortar. Uh, I was in a, I was in a mortar company in the Senate staff when I first went to Japan. But all the budget was so low for the army that all they done was have us dig a hole, put the tube down in the hole on the base plate. Never fired one. Okay, you couldn't. I was in downtown Tokyo. <laughs> I couldn't. I was right on the Tokyo Bay. Uh, and it just wasn't the appropriate area to do any training. Uh, we we took the occupation troops to uh, see that uh, everything the Japanese didn't cause any trouble, and they didn't. So it was really. Uh, well, I later. In 1949, I got transferred from the military police in San Drake, Japan, which is one of the main military bases in Japan, in the first cavalry division headquarters. Uh, we did go to Mount Fuji twice on maneuvers, and the other fellows, uh, I think, picked up quite a bit. That was in 1949, now, uh, and probably beginning maybe once in 49 and once in 1950. We were on Mount Fuji when the war started. When I say Mount Fuji, you're on the base of it, all right? You look up and you see it, okay? Got a lot of pictures of it. Uh, and I, I, I believe our, our soldiers, uh, when they went to Korea, had a uh, very good basic, uh, you know? Uh, but this uh, group that they got now, I imagine they start off with 18 weeks of basic, and then special schools or whatever uh, skills they got, you know. And uh, they also, they, they took a lot of our non-commissioned officers, uh, our sergeants, and two men, such as mortarmen and machine gunners. And when the war started, they sent uh, a troop from the, our division to the 25th and the 24th Infantry to build them up because the 24th was the first one that went to uh, Korea. Uh, and that's, you know, you, you count on your uh, not commissioned officers when you're off. And, 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 and when you're in garrison duty in Japan, you really don't like off. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to do this. <laughs> it doesn't like to make your life miserable. And, uh, but when you go into combat, your officers and your non-commissioned officers, you, you better hope that they know what they're doing because usually the peasants don't, you know. Right. And uh, we went through officers like crazy uh, in the first couple of months of that, that war. I don't know how many non uh, I don't know how many company commanders we went through in about two months. And a company commander in, in Korea was he might have been in a foxhole about 40 or 50 feet back here. I mean, the hill is here, and he's just back the other side of the hill. I mean, he's taking the mortar hits like you, and uh, yeah. so they're getting it. Speaking of leaders, did you know Coco that watched him? No, he was in the 3rd Battalion. He was in the 2nd Battalion, and you might as well say he was in the 16th Infantry, and I was in the 55th Mortar Battalion, you know? Because you don't know what's going on. You don't, go, you don't know what's going on in the next company in your own battalion. Uh, well, uh, I was only <laughs> I was only in action for the Chinese about two minutes. <laughs> I didn't even know they were in the war. Chinese, the our, our, our division, our, our, our regiment was the first regiment hit in the army 
And, and then the Marines were getting it the same day on November 1 and 2 over on the other side of the mountain. Uh, uh, the 1st Marine Division. Uh, that mountain range really divided it. So you couldn't get really over that place. There's no roads on it. And I'm only telling you what I read in books. Okay, I don't know what happened there. And I really... Was that the first time during the time you actually played a good role in here? Well, it was just on. The end of that war, October, October 16th, I'm, I'm going from the book now. I don't know. Well, that's, I'm, I didn't really know it, too, yeah. but I didn't realize that that was really the first thing that they had. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't know they were in the war. Even the, even the uh, people who were up on the front, who I met later, who I got captured, okay, from our battalion in the prison camp, okay. Uh, they were not knowing what was going on. They were reporting people, they seen people with their field glasses, long columns of them coming down the road. And I guess it was in that book where they, we, we were landing our artillery in the middle of uh, these columns, and uh, they wouldn't break the column. They just kept coming. So, uh, well, anyway, I guess they were guessing. <laughs> well, I, if you read the book, you'll know that MacArthur was being fed information that the Chinese were in the war from uh, Korean civilians and from prisoners that they captured with strange uniforms on. And uh, they wouldn't believe it. See? So, and they certainly aren't telling me about it. And, and, uh, and I don't know if even the first sergeant or the second lieutenant know about it up on the front. It was all a guessing game. And you know, after every unit starts reporting this, uh, then the uh, CIC or whatever the intelligence officers are were calling this thing for a bow, and they weren't turning any attention to them in Tokyo. A lot of the, uh, the we took some horrendous casualties in the first part of the Korean War. Uh, if, you, if they had a, a newspaper barrage and television barrage like they have now, they probably call that war off in a, year, in a month. We were losing 10,000 casualties a month, still captured and wounded when the 24th Division was getting ripped to pieces. And uh, we would have got it next because I, we went to a place called Yongdong, that was our farthest event. And Yongdong, uh, I remember being on a roadblock there and then finding out in a Life magazine about 40 years later that the North Koreans are already throwing a pincer around us. And uh, I remember taking off like a big bird, our regiment, you know, uh, or battalion. And uh, I think we got out by going not down the road, but out through the hills. Because they, they had it. Uh, and the pincers were halfway closed according to Life magazine. <laughs> I, I, I can't find the magazine. Uh, I got all the rest of them over there, but not that particular article. And uh, uh, it was scary because we we were finding out what they were doing to you when they caught you. Uh, and this no-gun reef uh, was about three miles from where we were. And actually, we were kind of panicked because we, we uh, the 24th Division, uh, on this roadblock I was on, which one of, must have been one of the main roads out of Pejang coming down south further to Yongdong. And these, 20, these guys that had just got busted to pieces up in Pejang come through us on a couple of jeeps, and they had something like 10, 10 guys on a jeep. They were on the front, on the back, hanging off the side, and they didn't even want to stop and talk to us. They didn't have their guns with them. Uh, all they were worried about was getting back to Pusan, I guess. <laughs> I don't, I don't blame them. That's where General Dean got mailed. And, uh, I mean, they were, they were, but, you know, uh, I guess you would call them, uh, expendable. And, uh, I don't know if we were expendable, but not to be anywhere near the extent that those guys were. They, they were, uh, out trained, out and out maneuvered, and under strength, and, uh, and they got treated. Terrible by the North Koreans. Uh, you know, we come with an elixir of suffering the same thing, and 
uh, it went on that way for the next couple of months. Uh, you know, we were back to the Nocturne River. And even then, when we got back to the Nocturne River, they busted into the defense line on the Nocturne River and uh, pushed almost to Pegu. And it was, uh, Pegu was, uh, Pegu was a, uh, provincial capital. Okay. And that, I got disinterred so bad there that I got sent back to Pegu from the guy to, we were probably six, eight miles out on the mountains to San Antonio. And I had a different service so bad that I had to throw my pants away. I got on that train uh, with no pants on, just a jacket. And uh, the, our coders, though, were hitting right into Pegu. I mean, I think they were aiming for that uh, railway station. There's only one rail line that's going out of that place. So I, I lucked out in a way because the next two or three weeks, uh, our division took a real pounding uh, on those mountains out by the Pegu. And uh, I don't know how long I was down. I wasn't in, uh, I wasn't in Tucson, but I was on some sort of a field or something where they had a field hospital set up. I was never actually in Tucson, but I probably was 10 miles or something from it, you know. You know they had a field hospital there for, I don't know how long I was there, two or three weeks. And, uh, but, 